Good evening. I'm Peter Rezichek from ShadowTrader.net, and this is the Weekend Edition. We've got a lot to talk about today. Markets continue to grind higher, kind of a balancing move, seven or eight days sideways, but very close to that all-time high in the S&P. So we're definitely going to check out the charts and talk about that. But this program is actually going to spend a good amount of time talking about the proverbial other side of the coin, which would be the potential that this market actually moves notably lower in September. And I'm going to go over the reasons why that might be the case. Without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start with our lead story today. This entire show is mainly about what the market is doing currently and where I believe the market might be going into the future so that we can all profit from it. I thought it was high time, however, given how high the market has been and how long it's rallied, that we start talking about one of the factors that could potentially make the market go down. There's really two specific things that can make a market go down. Now, obviously, there's a myriad number of factors that can come into play. We had COVID, we can have geopolitical news, there's all sorts of different catalysts that can come into play, but there's really two main things that can really derail a market, and those would be sharp rises in interest rates or economic contraction. And because obviously rates are at highs now and they're potentially about to come down, we're gonna focus on the last in this one and talk about something that may be leading the economy into recession soon, which would obviously have a negative effects on the market. Currently, if you've been paying attention to what the Federal Reserve has been doing and saying, it seems like they are taking a victory lap over inflation. They've got it down to about 2.9%, and we know that their mandate is 2%. So that leaves only the other mandate, which is what we're going to talk more about today, which is employment. So let's just do a little recap here on the Fed for a moment as to what those two mandates are. Remember, the Fed cares about this and why it does what it does Stable prices, keeping consumer inflation at or near 2%, that's their first mandate. And the second is they want maximum employment, which is the highest level of employment that an economy can sustain while keeping inflation stable. So remember that. And I believe that the Fed right now is starting to pivot towards this second uh, mandate here, which I think is very, very important and we should be paying attention. In Jackson Hole recently, Jerome Powell said this statement, and this really jumped out at me, and I feel it's very, very important, so I wanted to share it with you. In the statement, he said specifically, we do not seek or welcome future cooling in labor market conditions. This really struck a tone with me because you have to understand the man is going to choose his words very, very carefully. He is never going to use any sort of incendiary language or panicky language or anything that can throw the markets into a tailspin. It will always be a very measured comment similar to this, right? But you have to ask yourself this question is why did Jerome Powell say exactly this? I believe it's the simple fact that he knows that upticks in the unemployment rate always lead to recession. Not always, but almost always. And that kind of puts him in the hot seat for the time being. So given that, I've put together this chart here, which I got from Fred, excellent website you should all check out. This is the uh, Federal Reserve of St. Louis that comes out with all this data. And this is very simply the unemployment rate going all the way back to 1950 at the left side of the screen, right? Ticking up, ticking down. And the good people at the Federal Reserve have done us the courtesy of actually shading all the areas where the mark or the economy rather has been in recession. So you see them here. Uh, here's a big one here in 1980, we were in recession. 1990 was recession. 2000 here, 2010. Uh, this is the 0809 kind of area of the housing crisis, GFC, et cetera. Uh, then we have uh, COVID, et cetera, here in 2020, short one for COVID. And right now, the unemployment rate is sitting at 4.3% right here. And just look at this chart for a second and notice that every time you enter prior to the shaded areas before recession, what is the unemployment rate doing? Slight uptick, right? And then once you're actually in recession, boom, you get a big spike in unemployment, sometimes bigger than others. Obviously, COVID, that was kind of an aberrant situation. But in general, you see the slow uptick before you get into actual recession, right? So that being said, what I did here is I just took the same chart, but zoomed in just on the activity recently from July of 2022 to the current to show how this 4.3% number has been, you know, how we basically got to the 4.3, starting over here at about three and a half. And notice here in July, 2023, this is when things started upticking. You see the unemployment rate just moving, moving, moving up to here and taking us right to here to the last reading, which was in July of 2024. Now the next read is gonna come to us in September on September 6th. And this is why I believe this is very, very important because if that read comes in higher than this 4.3, then it is gonna be a little bit more confirmation that there's really potential of recession around the corner. 
Now, very similar to the FOMC, yours truly, the shadow trader, also has a dual mandate, but my dual mandate is a little bit different. It is to describe to everybody as objectively as possible what the market is doing currently and what I believe the market is going to do in the near future. So to that end, I took a moment and put together some slides for you of what has happened just in the last five recessions, going back to about 1981, we've had five since then, and I wanted to see exactly how much the market declines and how long those market declines last. So let's move over to this first slide here, which is the recession that happened from July 1981 to November of 19. And you can see here the shaded areas on the chart are always the recession and the candles are monthly bars of the S&P 500 and going back about 45 years here almost it's interesting to note that at that time the S&P was trading at the lows here on the low of that recession at about the hundred handle which is pretty incredible given that we're 5500 plus now so it's pretty interesting but the main thing you want to focus on here is what was the peak to trough during that time and how long did the market decline last? So in that recession there, there was 81, 82, it was a 22 and percent decline and it lasted 12 months. Let's go to the next one. In this one here, this is July 1990 to March 1991. This market decline was only three months. However, during that time, the peak to trough was 20.3%, so also pretty large. We'll move over to the third one during that time period now, which was March of 2001 to November 2001. This decline lasted six months and the peak to trough was over 25%, so pretty big. Let's go to the next one. This was the 0709. This one actually lasted quite a bit longer. As you know, if you recall, this was global financial crisis, housing, et cetera, so lots of things were going on. So this peak to trough was over 56% and the market decline lasted 15 months, so pretty bit, pretty large one. And then lastly, we have this one here, which was the COVID one, Feb uh, February 2020 to April 2020 not long in terms of market decline, only two months, but the peak to trough was massive, almost 34% on the move down. So this is really interesting stuff that I think everybody needs to know about. And what really is gonna be the focus here is what's going to happen on September 6th because that unemployment number is going to be coming out at that time, right? This is gonna give us a lot of clues as to what this market is gonna do and why I wanted to specifically discuss this in this particular video before that September 6th number comes out. These are the two big economic releases that I think everybody needs to focus on in the month of September. Again, September 6th is gonna be that unemployment rate that's gonna be released. You're gonna be looking for that number moving above that 4.3 and if so, that will sort of sound the drumbeat of recession, I think, a little bit louder. And then, of course, we've got the rate decision on the 18th, which is going to be extremely important because it's going to be the first time that the Fed is going to be potentially cutting rates. And so the main takeaway here is really that this is a big if, but it's a very, very important if. I want to make that very, very clear before we move on is that this is not a prediction. This is more talking about framework, right? Framework is very important because it gives you an idea of just how far a market could move if you were to get involved in that move. And that's why I wanted to show you historically how if this plays out how it has in the past, simply where the unemployment rate ticks up, leads the economy into recession, usually you can see that those average declines were about 25%. And then, you know, obviously that GFC crisis was even bigger. That was over 50%. But in general, you're looking at a decline between 20 to 25%. So that's why I'm talking about these particular economic releases and how important they are. And depending on how they come out, I think we could be in for some serious volatility in the month of September. All right, let's break from the fundamental and get back into the technical, which is where I love to be at all times. As I always say, I feel like everything always ends up being technical. And to that end, when I get into some of these daily charts of the broad market, I'm going to talk a lot about the potential setup of how to maybe play this recessionary activity if we are to have a big move down in September. Let's move over to the charts right now. Before we get into that more detailed look at the charts, I wanna pull back a bit and look at monthlies because I'm speaking to you on the last day of the trading month here in August, and of course we have monthly charts to deal with. So we're gonna start with this S&P. I think the main takeaway here, honestly, is sort of the parabolic nature of this in that you can see how you've had, a, you had an advance here. This one is just getting really steep. Right? And obviously we're close to that all time high, which I think is going to be in play next week at some point. But regardless, my main takeaway from these monthly charts is that because we had that large move down in August, notice that it left the huge shadow to the downside. Remember, at the end of a move, that's generally bearish. That sort of long tail when it happens on the lows is a bullish signal, especially on the monthlies. And that's the reason why I'm talking about this specifically. As you know, I'm not a big believer in the whole hammer, bottoming tail hammer, whatever. I only pay 
pay attention on the larger time frames, which is really where I feel that it really shines. And if you look at this monthly bar, obviously because we had that yen scare earlier in the month, that caused that long shadow to the downside and left us with this hanging man. Hanging man is just essentially when you have this bullish looking bar that has the long shadow on the bottom with the, the body on top, but it's at the top end of a range as opposed to the bottom end of a range. So something to keep in mind. That chart pattern and also the fact of how steep it's been on the monthly and on the monthly, just how far away you are from the eight period EMA, right? Look at your eight EMA, it's actually 52.68 currently, and where's price now? 56.50, you're really much, much higher. That's kind of overextended, so just kind of keep that in mind. You know, the monthly charts obviously are something you're gonna be looking at if you're looking at a longer term play, but again, I can't stress enough, framework, 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 right? If there is some larger short to be had here, how far down is it gonna go? Are you gonna cover it right away just on the first day, or are you gonna see if this monthly chart can get at least down to the eight, right? That's the way I'd be thinking on a larger short play here in the S&P. Same time frame, but of course, the other chart that I like to look at so much, which is the NASDAQ 100, obviously nowhere near the all-time highs as tech has been lagging in this run by a lot. And this is important because remember that technology is over 30% of the S&P. So where this NASDAQ goes, as far as if it holds weakness, it's gonna have some action and some bearing on the S&P. But I think as far as this monthly chart is concerned, what you really wanna pay attention to is that this hanging man here is very, very pronounced as we just talked about in the S&P. And then also that distance from where we are to there to the all-time high. I'm gonna be watching very, very closely especially when I get into the daily charts in a moment, talking about how what could happen if that S&P hits a new all-time high and that NASDAQ keeps lagging. Let's get a little more granular for a second, down to the S&P 500 daily. And this is where things get really, really interesting, especially given that we are in a balance right now. Balance rules do apply. And what do balance rules tell us? That the market can only do one of three things, right? You can either break out of balance and keep going, break out of balance and fail and come back, right? That's the upside kind of uh, idea. Downside, you can break down and keep going or break down and go back in, or you can remain in balance. Balance rules are very, very powerful and they should be paid attention to it. Right now, this market is in balance, as you can see on the cash market, where you can really have a nice definition here from highs to lows and everything is basically equal, especially these lows, which is really, really noteworthy, is that these lows here, I'll just redraw that, these lows here are literally equal to the penny, so mark them off. These two pullback lows in the S&P 500 cash are exactly equal, and that's relatively rare. So given this balance area moving potentially higher uh, early into next week, that's a pretty easy one. Obviously, you can see the ES closed, or S&P rather, cash closed very, very strong, just about at the upper end of it, putting this all-time high here into place. So we're gonna be looking for 56.70 next week. That's pretty obvious. It seems that that's the direction that the S&P is headed. But let's just say that over the months of September, we get this recessionary drumbeat and we get some sort of downside action that is pretty strong. Could be on the September 6th number, could be on the September 18th number, might not happen at all. Remember, this is all if. We're talking about potentials, we're talking about framework, we're not talking about prediction. We're not getting ahead of this. Rather, we are setting up the framework for how we are going to potentially react if it happens. And to that end, what I wanna talk about is Let's just say that there's a breakout here in the S&P and we make the new all-time high. What do you think is gonna happen to sentiment at that point? Okay, sentiment is gonna be very, very positive and everybody's gonna probably go back to bullish because it is really impossible for retail traders especially to not feel bullish when their 401k balances are at all-time highs. That's just how it is basically. So the sentiment is gonna flip there which is generally a bullish thing, right? Because what it's gonna do is it's gonna bring everybody to one side of the boat and there's gonna be some sort of a major imbalance. So let's say we get an all-time high and then we get the recessionary drumbeat coming back in and we start to retest the all-time high, but more importantly, what would happen if we then came down and retested the low end of balance, okay? That to me is the dream sequence setup. That's what I call the dream setup for the short, which is very, very important. And if you recall, that is very, very similar to what happened on the yen move, which I talked about, about that trade from a couple weeks back, right? You had the movement here, which was the breakout of balance, Right, look at the breakout of balance. 
and then the failure, and what happened in the failure? You went to the low end of balance, and that caused the big move lower. So markets tend to repeat this way, right? It's just history, it's just how things are. This is how markets act, and why is that? Because remember, at their core, everything is technical. And what drives technicals is the simple fact of understanding where are the greatest amount of people going to be happy, and where are the greatest amount of people going to be scared and sad. And what you want to do in your trading in order to catch a larger move or really to catch any move is just to start to understand where the imbalances are going to occur. So to me, the largest potential imbalance in this market that would occur would simply be if you had a push above the all-time high, come back into range. At that point, you should bounce off the all-time high because we know that prior resistance should become new support. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but let's say that it doesn't and you come back down into range hard. This strikes me as a very, very important area because there's that double bottom in the cash. And again, you're gonna have major disappointment of new money longs that were getting long on the bullish sentiment, sentiment excuse me, of the all-time high. And then when you come back down, what do you think is gonna happen to this 10-day balance area that is all going to be overhead supply and from there on the next move should be definitively lower. Now on to the NASDAQ 100 and this is really interesting so pay close attention I think to this chart and as I'm going over this particular chart on the daily of the cash market of the NASDAQ 100 keep in mind what that balance area looked like in the S&P 500 because they are markedly different. You obviously have the same amount of days of balance, but is it going sideways or is it going down? This is very, very interesting. It's actually going down. And so my whole take on this that I think ties in with the other chart is that if you see some sort of failure in the S&P coming back into range, et cetera, it should be exacerbated by the NASDAQ 100 because the distance between where you are and the all-time high is so great, you're nowhere near it, and you could easily be putting in a lower high here that could fail. So that's what you're gonna be watching for. But the big break is gonna occur at the same point as the S&P does, which is obviously the low end of the range here. And as you can see, they are kind of, you know, this, this low here ties in with this low and you've got a gap fill here. So obviously that would be the bigger short signal. But again, the main thing takeaway from this particular chart is just the relative weakness is that tech has been lagging, NASDAQ 100 has been lagging, and if there's some sort of a lower high situation or a rollover, I would say even some sort of market action on a rally that can't make it here would be very noteworthy, right? This is gonna be an important area just around that 20,000 or just below because if the S&P rallies and you get that bullish sentiment and you're going over the all-time high, regardless, you're gonna to wanna to at least see the NASDAQ 100 move over here. Right? And if it can at least get to there, then again, you may have some negativity in the NASDAQ. So this is gonna be very important. Watch this very, very closely, this relationship between the two. They've been extremely disconnected as of late. Those of you who trade futures every day, you know that these two markets in terms of ES and NQ are getting very disconnected all the time. Uh, NQ seems to be being led around by NVIDIA again, since they've uh, reported earnings. This happens a lot with the NQ where it just gets very, very tied to what NVIDIA is doing. So there's a lot really to unpack here, but mainly thing is watch these levels very closely as we move into September. Time now for our number one draft pick and this ties in a lot with what I've been talking about in the program about a potential, accent on the word potential, potential downturn in the market. So our number one draft pick today is the UVXY which is the uh, Ultra VIX short term futures ETF. This is probably going to be something that's going to be important only if we get that downturn. I want to stress very importantly, this is not something that you want to be invested in for a long period of time. And I'll get into that in a moment as to why that is. But generally, volatility products are something that everybody should have in their repertoire, I feel, if the market does have a potential downturn, because there's a lot of money to be made in a short period of time trading volatility. The VIX itself is not investable, so you can take that off the table, okay? VIX options are a little bit tricky because they're not really options on the VIX at all. They're actually options on VIX futures that look out about 30 days, and VIX futures themselves have a tick value that translates into $1,000 per point, so it's not something that I really want to recommend to the average trader and investor out there. And so that leaves us with the ETFs like the UVXY to use as a product to trade volatility. Now, there's about 12 of these 
uh, ETFs out there that track volatility, but many of them are zombie ETFs. Not many, but there's a handful that are zombie ETFs, meaning they don't really trade much volume. They're probably going to get delisted. Some of them are inverse, so if the VIX goes up, it goes down and vice versa. This is my favorite. This is the one that I wanted to focus on the most, which is the uh, UVXY because it's an ultra. And what it seeks to do is to capture one and a half times the movement of, of the VIX on any given day. And this is very, very important. But what a lot of people get tripped up on in this is that it does tend to decay a lot and it has a lot of downward movement over time. And that's why you really only want to be involved in these things for a short window of time when that volatility is rising and then kind of be out, take your money and run, et cetera. Before we go further, let's do a brief rundown exactly how this UVXY works because it's very important to understand this intrinsically so that you know why this sort of decaying happens, right? The UVXY is not actually tracking the VIX, and that's what frustrates a lot of traders and investors. It's not on the VIX. It's actually tracking VIX futures, but what it does is it tracks those futures in a very interesting way in that it tracks a combination of the front month and the back month. So think of it as the current month of VIX futures and then the month that's right after it, and the UVXY is always invested in those. So let's just say that we were at the last day of a particular month. On that day, those those futures are expiring and the UVXY would be 100% invested in what we call the back month. The next day it would flip and that back month would become the new front month. And here's where it gets interesting. From that moment on over the course of the month, let's keep it simple and say that there's 20 trading days. Obviously 20 trading days would be 5% a day. It's then going to take 5% of that front month and sell it and buy 5% of the back month. And a lot of people think that this is where that decay happens, but on a cash basis, that number is actually equal. The UVXY doesn't actually lose anything in that transaction. The same amount of money that is coming out of one is going into the other. But where that decay actually occurs is just the simple fact that because this front month, back month combination is always going to be a little bit higher than the VIX, as time goes on and that future decays and gets closer to expiry, that's the only time that the future, much like all futures, right? The ES works the exact same way. Way, that's the only time that that future is going to actually equal the cash market. So in a normalized market environment, which is basically sideways to up, which is, the mark, which is what the market is doing all the time, the UVXY is always going to have a negative bias over time because those futures contracts are constantly slowly crunching to where the actual VIX is as opposed to when the market goes down hard and volatility increases greatly, now the actual VIX shoots up really high. And remember the actual VIX is on S&P options. When that VIX gets really high, now all of a sudden the VIX futures or that VIX futures complex, we'll call it, or whatever that sort of front month, back month, it now has to adjust and move higher to play catch up to move up to where the actual VIX is. And that and only that is gonna cause the upturn in the UVXY. And this is really, really important. And this is why I've been saying that you don't wanna be involved in this on a longer term basis because of that constant decay. And you really only wanna get involved with a product like the UVXY when the market actually starts moving down. And given all that, for purposes of illustration, this weekly chart is really the reason why I'm boring you with everything that I just told you because it illustrates so perfectly how the UVXY has that negative bias moving down. This is a weekly chart going back pretty far showing you how that negative bias works and it just keeps floating lower. And this is why you don't want to get ahead of this. You really want to be using these products once the train already leaves the station and you're pretty sure that a larger downturn is coming and then you want to jump on these products for a quick move that can last a couple of days or weeks, etc. And if we zone in here or zoom in rather on the daily, which shows the recent market activity, this illustrates it absolutely perfectly, right? Is that this is why I'm saying that these particular products should be in every trader's repertoire only when there is a sharp downturn because there is a lot of money to be made in a short period. Notice that when you had the decoupling of the uh, yen, of the yen trade unwinding temporarily, right? Look what happened to the UVXY. It was a run in just a few days of 22 to 60. It was a triple, which is amazing, but then because that volatility is so mean reverting, obviously the cash market now is much higher than it was even before this crisis, and look what happened to the UVXY, complete collapse from 66 right back 
down to the 22 handle where we sit today. So this is why you have to understand this is something that you want to be in. Again, once the train has already left the station, make your money and get out. But there's a lot of money to be made here, I think, on a pop. If this plays out like we have been talking about, where we do have these recessionary fears and the market does have a prolonged downturn, this UVXY is something that I think should be in your repertoire. That's all for this week. Thank you so much for hanging out. Let's recap a little bit of what we discussed in this program. Remember, this is all about potential and not prediction, okay? Prediction can sometimes get you killed, but reacting in an intelligent manner when the odds are heavily skewed in your favor can make you a lot of money. So in this case, the potential is that the market could go down big if the drumbeat of recession is sounding and the framework that we discussed is to tell you how far down the market could potentially go if you were to pull off a short once that starts to get underway. Beyond that, don't forget to consider volatility products like UVXY because they can be very, very lucrative in a downturn. And most importantly, hit the like and subscribe buttons and also that bell so you can be notified whenever Shadow Trader posts new videos, all right? That's all. See you next week. It's going to be an interesting one because I'm going to be talking to you next week on September 6th, which is actually the day that that labor number is going to be reported. We're going to get that unemployment figure on the 6th, so it should be a doozy. Coming at you from Los Angeles, California. As always, I wish you good trading and good night.